Hey friends, welcome back to the Maranatha Global Bible Study on the Rapture and the Endurance of the Saints. So as promised last week, in this session I'm going to begin addressing um, the pre-wrath rapture, the pre-wrath rapture view. I'm going to address both some of what I see as the, the strengths as well as some of the weaknesses um, of this position. And um, as I mentioned briefly, Last week, I sort of told the story of how I came to personally uh, embrace the pre-wrath rapture view. Uh, I'm going to say over 20 years ago. It's been a long time. Um, I'm just thinking, it seems like just yesterday, but it was, I'm thinking of the house that I was living in at the time. So it was, it was over 20 years ago. Um, I was really wrestling through the issue of the rapture. Um, I would have said that I'm post-trib, but yet I found myself unable to answer just some of the basic sort of uh, cliches and arguments that are often thrown out by those who are pre-trib, and it sort of thrust me into studying this issue. And so I was reading all kinds of articles and wrestling through it. And, I, and it, the more that I read, the more that I became frustrated, quite frankly. Um, and so in that situation, I just gave myself legitimately to 21 days of fasting and prayer. And it was toward the end and continuing to read all these articles and so forth. But it was toward the end of that time that I went into a Christian bookstore and I found Robert Van Campen's book, The Rapture Question Answered Plain and Simple. As I mentioned last week, Robert Van Campen, along with uh, Brother Marv Rosenthal, they, they were friends and kind of working through these issues together. And really they wrote, um, they, were, they were the earliest sort of articulators um, popularizing the pre-wrath rapture. So when I read Van Campen's book, it absolutely felt like it was the answer to prayer. Um, and the reason for that is because when the pre-wrath rapture view is laid out, when you understand the basic arguments that frame the pre-wrath rapture, um, it's, it's relatively very simple, and most often the simplest answer to just about anything, you know, if you can explain it very simply, you're going to convince a lot of people. Um, if you have these very complicated, very difficult answers, people can't wrap their heads around it. They go, it's, it just sounds complicated. And so in reading his book, really, and I, again, I mentioned this last week, the thing that just gripped me, and in fact, this is so clear in the scriptures that it's, it's almost surprising that more pre-tribbers don't read this and go, oh gosh, and become pre-wrath or, you know, or post-trib, but definitely leave the, um, the indefensible uh, view of the pre-trib rapture behind. But essentially in the book, I was reading about the simple fact that in the book of Revelation, it's at the sixth seal that you have the cosmic signs, okay? So the sun goes dark, the moon turns blood, the powers of the heavens are shaken, this type of thing. And then when you look in the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, that's Jesus's sermon on the end times, in verse 29, it specifically says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, what happens? Well, you'll have the sign of the coming of the Son of Man in the sky, but you'll have the cosmic signs. The sun goes dark and the moon turns to blood. Very specific sign, very specific event or series of events. So when you, and then you continue to read there in Matthew 24, and Jesus says, then... Uh, he will gather together his elect from the four corners of the earth, from one end of the sky to the other. Okay, so you go, well, there's the rapture, right? The gathering together of the elect into the sky. You go, there's the rapture, and it happens after the cosmic signs, which the book of Revelation puts at the sixth seal, in between the sixth and the seventh seal. So you go, okay, boom. Like, that's a very, very easy, very clear reality that we all have to deal with in the scriptures. Now, the next, and that's a strength. Again, it's just, it's very clear, it's very simple, it's biblical. The rapture happens after the sixth seal. Like, it amazes me that pre-tribbers believe the rapture happens before the sixth seal. Like, it's just, you know, again, they look at what's right in front of them and they go, that's not the rapture. You go, you got the blasting of the trumpet, the gathering together of the elect, the angels, the voice of a archangel, the trumpet of God, all these different things, the gathering together of the elect in the sky, and they go, no, that's Israel being regathered to the land, or this type of thing. Okay, the other strength that sort of goes with this, um, this perspective is the fact that it, 
it lays out an argument, and I find it to be, uh, again, um, at least at the beginning, a very effective argument. I, I actually don't know that it's the best argument now, and I'll address this um, later. But it makes a clear distinction between the tribulation, because when does the rapture happen? Again, after the tribulation. And then they would hold that after the sixth seal, then you have the trumpets and the bowls, and that's the wrath of God. They would say that is the wrath, that is the judgment, the punishment of God being poured out on the earth against the wicked, right? So they make this very clear distinction between the tribulation of Satan, the persecution of Satan, and the wrath of God. This is really one of the linchpins of the pre-wrath perspective. And again, um, when you first hear it, you go, oh, okay, this helps, especially if you're pre-trib, it really helps reconcile one of the biggest pre-tribulational arguments, which you'll hear pre-tribbers make like a mantra. They'll repeat this, beat this drum, they'll say, we are not appointed to wrath. And then they'll say, the tribulation is the wrath of God, all of it. They'll say, the seals, the trumpets, and the bulls, it's all the wrath of God. Therefore, because we're not appointed to wrath, we must be logically, they'll say, removed from the earth. God cannot have us present on the earth while the wrath of God, the judgments of God, are being poured out on the earth. The pre-wrath perspective resolves this, or it answers this very, very popular pre-tribulational uh, claim or argument. Okay, so that's another strength, if you will, of the pre-wrath perspective. Um, it also resolves um, one of the very common objections to the post-tribulational perspective, which is, well, no man, and again, I just did a whole session on this just uh, a few weeks ago um, in this series. If you want to you know, get more in-depth, you can go back to that session. But they'll say, like, look, if the rapture happens at the end, the 1,360 days after the abomination of desolation, or the 1,390 days, or the 1,335, I'm sorry, 1,260 days, 1,290 days, or 1,335 days, depending on where you stand on that, they go like, we can know the exact day and the hour. As I addressed, uh, again, a couple sessions ago, it's not that simple. It simply is not that simple. But people will say, if you're post-trib, we will know the exact day and the hour because it's at the end of seven years. And again, as I addressed, I go, the end of seven biblical years, 360-day years, 365-day years, literal years. Is it the 1,260 days or is it the 1,200? There's multiple problems. The, the reality is we won't know because there's just too many variables. Okay, but it does resolve that, um, that very common argument that's made against the post-tribulational rapture. Now, this one is very important to me um, because this is one that I will not give up, and I have not given up. It addresses the complexity of the return of Jesus, which is to say this, that oftentimes with regard to uh, the rapture, it's sort of envisioned because people, again, Christians tend to be very New Testament-centric in their Bible study. Um, they don't really grasp the totality of the Old Testament narrative. So they just zero in on a verse in the New Testament. And most Christians, when they think about the return of Jesus, they think of Revelation 19. In, in the eyes of the overwhelming majority of Christians who haven't really gone deep, Revelation 19 is the quintessential culminative, uh, cumulative, it's the final great picture in the Bible of the return of Jesus. And they imagine it as an event that sort of happens, that for all intents and purposes, Jesus basically just snaps his fingers, the armies of the Antichrist are destroyed, all things are made new, and it all really unfolds very, very quickly, like in a day. Like he comes back, boom, everything's done. And the reality is the biblical narrative actually lays out a very complex event or series of events that unfolds over a period of time. And in my book, Sinai to Zion, I actually discuss much of what that looks like. There's this great procession, this march from the south. The Old Testament is littered with references to Yahweh God Almighty coming in anthropomorphic form, in the form of a human, marching before his people, setting prisoners free, making procession up to Jerusalem as the greater Moses, as part of the second or the ultimate exodus, if you will. And so uh, this is one of the strengths of the pre-wrath perspective. I think it highlights, it champions the complexity of the return of Jesus, and that is, I would argue, an unarguable 
um, biblical reality. The return of Jesus is not just one singular instantaneous event that just happens with a snap of the fingers, but like virtually everything else that the Lord has ever done, such as coming the first time, being born, being raised as an infant, as a toddler, as a preteen, going through puberty, becoming a teenager, like all those things, that's all part of the incarnation of God in Christ. It didn't just happen in a day, right? It actually unfolded over 33 years. Now again, it's never framed as just some singular one-day event, the incarnation, but the point is the Lord often operates and functions within the normal rules of life. Like it's very earthly, it's not all magic, it's not all just angels show up and he snaps his fingers and all things are made new and you know this type of thing. It unfolds in a very real earthy way. Okay, so this is something, we're going to discuss this a little bit more as we move on, but that is another strength of the pre-wrath perspective. Now, I could list a handful of other strengths of the pre-wrath. I'm not, I'm, try, not, tr I'm not trying to be exhaustive here, to be clear. Now I'm going to shift into um, what I see as some of its biggest weaknesses, some of its biggest challenges that I personally can't get around. Okay, so let me just begin by saying that while the pre-wrath perspective mitigates, in fact, I think it resolves several of the most glaring problems with the pre-tribulational view of the rapture, unfortunately, I think it retains, maintains, some of the problems with pre-tribulationism. Now, interestingly enough, uh, some years ago I watched a... Um, uh, video of Charles Cooper, um, and he was talking about the pre-wrath view, and he said essentially that the pre-wrath view, it's a synthesis. It's a synthesis between the pre-trib view and the post-trib view. Essentially what he's saying is if you take the strengths of the post-trib view and the strengths of the pre-trib view, you bring those together, you end up with the pre-wrath perspective. To a degree, that's true. And it's, I would actually say that it's for that reason that so many pre-tribbers leave pre-tribulationism and embrace pre-wrath, because it does resolve some of the glaring holes, some of the unresolvable problems with pre-trib. However, as I'll argue here in a minute or just present here in a minute, um, I think it does retain, as I said, some of the problems because many who have embraced the pre-wrath perspective are coming from previously having been pre-tribbers. And so I think it brings some of the baggage, some of the problematic baggage of pre-tribulationism, and it doesn't completely shed all of the errors. What is the first one? And this is the big one, is that no matter how you slice it, the pre-wrath perspective has more than one coming of Jesus. Now, this is going to upset some people when I say this. They go, that's not true. Look, the pre-wrath perspective, in, in very simplified terms, is the idea that the return of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus, it can happen anytime within the final three and a half years. That once the abomination of desolation is set up and we enter that final three and a half years, the return of Jesus is imminent. For all intents and purposes, we don't know when it will be. It could happen at any given time. Most usually move it a little bit closer to, you know, like, let's say, a year and a year and a half before the conclusion of the seven years. They say Jesus comes back and raptures the believers to heaven, and then he goes back up with them to heaven, but then at the end of the tribulation, he comes back for Armageddon. Thus, Revelation 19 is the coming back of Jesus from heaven after he has already returned. So from a pre-wrath perspective, Revelation 19 is not the return of Jesus. It is a second coming from heaven of Jesus. There's really no way to get around it. And this is one of my biggest problems with pre-tribulationism. I took a whole session and addressed this, but let's just look at a few scriptures because to me this is a biggie. And again, no matter how you slice it, now again, I want to be clear, um, pre-wrathers will say, no, 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 it's not multiple comings of Jesus. It's one coming, one singular event that is complex, that unfolds possibly over a, you know, a three-year period. And I go, that sounds good, but I don't buy it. it. Like, you can't say it's a singular, one single event that unfolds over years. Now, again, you could say, well, what about the incarnation? The incarnation was an entire lifetime. It's, you're really dealing with two very different things. Now, again, 
I want to affirm the complexity of the return of Jesus. I personally believe the return of Jesus will unfold over a 30, 45-day period, something like in that window, the amount of time that it takes for him to return and march from Egypt up to Jerusalem. I think it's going to be about a 45-day period, okay? And I go, that's still, you know, complex. I'm saying it's a singular event, but it unfolds over 45 days. But a few years, or even a solid year, to me, I go, I just, that to me strains believability. I just personally have a very difficult time with that. And beyond simply having a difficulty saying something that unfolds over a couple years is one single um, cohesive event, I still have to maintain that it does hold that there are multiple returns. There is the first coming return, he goes back up to heaven, and then later he comes back from heaven again. So he's kind of bouncing back and forth, and just we need to be honest about it, that is what it teaches. Now again, the pre-trib perspective teaches the same thing. He comes down, he gathers us, that's one coming, he goes back up, and later is the glorious coming. The problem that I've been trying to point out to pre-tribbers is that the scriptures overwhelmingly refer to the singular coming of the Lord. It never uses the word comings, plural. It just, that word cannot be found anywhere in the scriptures. Yet pre-tribbers 100% affirm two comings of Jesus. You can't get around it. And to a degree, pre-wrath also holds that there are at least two comings of Jesus. There's some that have these real complex views and they end up with like three comings of Jesus. They would say Revelation 19 is like another event. Like he's bouncing back and forth and doing all sorts of things. But for the most part, most say he comes down, raptures us, goes back up, the saints are in heaven, and then later he comes back, Revelation 19. Two comings. Okay, the scriptures say in Hebrews 9, 27 through 28, inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once. Now, we're dealing here with quantitative terms. You know, like it's once and it's contrasting once. So, in other words, this is about how many times something happens. That's very specific, the context of what's being spoken of here. It says, inasmuch as it's appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment, so after we die comes the judgment, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, he will appear a second time for salvation, to come back to save his people. Without reference to sin, he's not coming back to die on the cross for our sins. No, he's coming back to save us. He will appear a second time, not a second and a third time. He came once for sins. He will come again a second time for salvation without reference to sin. This is a glaring, huge, undeniable problem for pre-tribbers who do hold that Jesus comes comes. They will point to verses that say Jesus comes, and they'll say, well, that's the coming in the clouds to rapture us. That's the coming later in glory. And they'll point to passages that use the word coming and apply them to two different events seven years apart. Now, pre-wrath doesn't do that. They don't call uh, Revelation 19, they don't call that the third coming of Jesus. But it is still a coming from heaven, is the point. And the scriptures are clear that there is only one second coming. Now, here's the, uh, there are actually two passages that are very important with regard to the pre-wrath perspective. Acts 2, 32 through 35. So here's Peter preaching after Pentecost. He says, this Jesus God raised up. Um, and of all that, and we are all witnesses. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. Sorry, I'm removing all of the uh, footnotes that I didn't previously remove. We receive the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. And then here it is. David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord. So Yahweh says to Adonai, the Father says to the Son, sit at my right hand, until, until when? Until I make your enemies your footstool. So Jesus will sit at the right hand of God until the time comes for him to crush his enemies like grapes. Now the pre-wrath perspective says that Jesus returns maybe a year, maybe two, maybe even three years before the time comes for him to crush his enemies like grapes. That he returns and then goes back to heaven 
And then a few years later or a year later or maybe a few months later, he comes back, Revelation 19 for Armageddon. That's when he makes his enemies a footstool. That's when he crushes his enemies under his feet. But it could be a few years later. The scriptures say that Jesus will sit at the right hand of the Father until the time comes for him to come back and judge his enemies, to crush his enemies like grapes. Okay, then you have Acts 3, 19 through 21, very similarly. He says, repent therefore and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Peter's preaching. He says that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now ready? And that the Lord will send the Messiah, Christ, appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive until. Jesus will remain in heaven until when? Until the time for the restoring of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Heaven will receive Jesus until it's time to restore all things. The pre-wrath perspective holds that he could return as much as a year or a couple or a few years before the time comes for him to restore all things. That there could be a few year gap in between his coming and then later his second return for the purpose of crushing his enemies and restoring all things. Again, for me, this is a problem. For me, this is something that I just go, this just, it doesn't sit well with me. Hermeneutically, it just doesn't work or logically it doesn't work. Could I be wrong? Yeah, I could be wrong. But I, I have a problem with this. Matthew 25 says that when Jesus returns, he will reestablish the throne of David, the throne of glory, it's specifically referred to, right? Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes back in his glory and all of his angels with him, then he will sit on his throne of glory. The pre-wrath perspective says that when Jesus comes back, he turns around and goes back to heaven. And then he comes back from heaven, again, maybe a couple years later, and reestablishes the throne of David. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, and that word there in the Greek, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, T-O-T-E, let's just say, spell it in English, at that time. It's like then, when he comes with his angels, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Where? In Jerusalem. It's not like he's going to come and then go back up and sit on some new glorious throne. And this is also referenced, by the way, in Matthew 19. Another problem, in my view, is that three times, now again, We've addressed this previously, but three times we're told that the rapture happens at the, at the last trumpet, okay? Now, I know Alan Kirshner has addressed this multiple times, and he says, well, the last trumpet that Paul speaks of is different than the last trumpet in the book of Revelation, and he says one is a judgment event, the other is a deliverance event. I would say that's a bit of a false dichotomy, as if one has to be one or the other exclusively. Something can be a judgment slash deliverance event. Most often, everything that the Lord does has multiplicitous uh, purposes, right? I don't see that as a really effective argument. It's just sort of a declaration, a declaration that's made because obviously it's a problem for the pre wrath perspective. Now, again, I, I could be totally wrong. We could be dealing with different things here, but I don't see any, like, it's very difficult to say that after the last trumpet, there are at least seven more trumpets. I go, that's like really confusing. And I'm not saying there's nothing confusing in the Bible. I'm just saying it doesn't sit well with me. It's really difficult when the primary focus of the New Testament is that the resurrection happens at the coming of the Lord, at the last trumpet, and then you get into the book of Revelation and it utilizes this imagery that would have been very common, understood by everyone, and to say, but those are totally different trumpets. And yeah, I know it was called the last trumpet, but it's not really the last trumpet because there's many other trumpets. I just go, that just doesn't sit well with me. And so that will always be sort of a point of contention between the pre-wrath and the post-trib perspective. Um, Acts number one, I'm sorry, Acts chapter one, says that Jesus will come back. Now, this is very important. They're there on the Mount of Olives. Jesus ascends into heaven. They're all watching him go up. These two angels are sitting there. They go, men of Galilee, why are you standing there staring into the sky? The same Jesus who you just saw taken up into heaven, will come back in the same way. I believe it's uh, verse 6, in the same way that you just saw him go up. Maybe it's verse 7. Now, pre-wrath, like our pre-trib brothers and sisters, 
they violate this passage saying that he comes back partially and then he goes back to heaven. And then maybe a year again, a couple years later, he comes back. That's not what the angel said. They said he went up from the earth up to heaven and he's coming back in the same way that you saw him go up, he's coming back. Uh, this whole sort of, you know, multiple coming sort of thing unfolding over, again, potential few years, that's really the big rub for me. I just, I have a very difficult time with that. Another problem, in my opinion, is that um, Thessalonians says that we will meet Christ in the clouds, but then the parable of the foolish and wise virgins portrays them going out to meet him and escorting him back. Okay, so the pattern, and I've addressed this in previous sessions, the pattern of the triumphal entry, which is that once he descends, there's only one coming. Once he descends, he comes all the way down. We go up and we meet him, and just like the triumphal entry, when they went out of the city to meet him, laid out palm branches and their clothes and so forth, their jackets, and then they brought him, they ushered him back into the city. Likewise, we will go up and meet him and then usher him back. And by the way, a lot of people go, well, what's the reason for us going up into the sky? Let me just explain something, and this is kind of fun. We live on a globe. Let's say Jesus returns over here. If we all just shot directly to him, people would be shooting directly through the earth. Rather, we go out into the air, and then we meet him and usher him back to Jerusalem. So there will be no cutting through the middle of the core of the earth, right? If you're on the opposite side of the globe, when Jesus returns... You'll go out into the air, and then you'll meet him in the air. And then we usher him back, just like the first triumphal entry. The second triumphal entry will be very similar. He descends, we meet him, we continue with him um, on the descent, just like in the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. They go out to meet him, but he is on his way, and then they usher him back. They don't go out and meet him and then go back to his house. Despite what our preacher brothers and sisters say, that's not what the text says. And that's not the pattern of the first triumphal entry. Scripture says, and this is, um, this is pretty important, the scriptures say that the Antichrist will wear down the saints. It says he'll do multiple things. It says he'll wear down the saints, he will trample Jerusalem, and he will reign for three and a half years. Okay, the Bible says that when Jesus comes back, like when he comes back, he kills the Antichrist. He slays him by the splendor of his coming. It describes the splendor, the glory of his coming, and him slaying the Antichrist with um, the sword of his mouth, with the breath of his mouth, and this type of thing. Pre-wrath has Jesus killing the Antichrist as much, again, as a few years after his first coming. Okay, Daniel... Uh, 7, 25. I and mean, we can look at a bunch of different verses, but just here's an example. The Antichrist will speak out against the Most High, wear down the saints of the Highest One, and he will intend to make alterations in times and the law. They will be given, who? The saints will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So here it says that the saints of the Most High will be given into the hand of the Antichrist for how long? Three and a half years. So the pre-wrath perspective is forced to say, well, the saints here... That's Israel. That's not the church. So you end up with very similar um, sort of arguments. Do you see the commonalities here with the pre-tribulational arguments? They go, well, that's not us because we already previously know that we get raptured sometime before the full three and a half years. You can look at multiple other passages. The reign of the Antichrist and his persecution of the saints is indicated as lasting a full three and a half years. That's very difficult um, to get around. So I'm going to wrap it up right here. Um, this was, uh, you know, again, like we could go on and on about this. As I said last week, this is not something that I personally, I don't think it's worth arguing about. I think it's interesting. I think it's worth talking about. Again, I have such a big mouth. I'm quite sure I'll get martyred before the end of the three and a half years. So whether we get raptured two and a half years or three and a half years, it's really not all that relevant. The main thing is that we are prepared for what's coming. We're prepared for the great tests. We can argue about the length of it and exactly when we'll be raptured and that sort of thing. Um, and, and again, I'm not poo-pooing these discussions. I'm just saying it's not worth fighting. It's not worth like arguing about. And I'm just presenting my perspective. You take it for what it's worth. Be Bereans. 
study the scriptures, ask the Holy Spirit, but most of all, just be prepared. Okay, so in next week's session, I'm going to do what I just did, except that I'm going to do it with the post-tribulational rapture. I'm going to highlight the strengths and the weaknesses of the post-trib view, um, and then in the session after that, I'm going to offer my best effort to try to reconcile the two. I'm not going to offer anything super clear and revelatory, um, but just sort of present sort of where I'm at, acknowledging that I'm uh, still up in the air on a lot of issues, and I'm not really concerned about having all of the answers. I'm concerned about being prepared. So amen and amen. Um, I trust that this was helpful. I, I, I have a feeling this is going to stir up all kinds of controversy, um, and that's fun. But just, guys, whatever you do, just be nice. Love each other. Honor one another. Um, so amen and amen. Look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, God bless, and Maranatha. <laughs>